Shalom and welcome. It's Temple Talk, Israel National Radio. Today is the 16th day of Adar Sheni, 5774, the day after Shushan Purim. It's March 18th, 2014, and this week, Parshat Shmini, and the third of the four special Shabbatot leading up to Pesach, Parshat Para. So, it was a wonderful Purim here in Jerusalem. Absolutely. And my best friend Yitzhak Ruvain came to our home. I paid a visit on Shushan Purim, yeah. Came to, uh, to uh, for, it was, uh, it was a, I wouldn't call it a cameo appearance. He stayed a little while. And it was very beautiful as we searched for the presence of Hashem in every hidden scenario. Rabbi. Which is one of the main themes of, of Purim. That no matter what, no matter how it looks, no matter how bleak it is, his name isn't even written in the scroll of Esther, but Hashem is behind everything and with everything and constantly giving us His love and compassion, and it's, we're always subject to divine providence. Rabbi Yitzchak. In the spirit of Purim, you know, Nafohu, I'm going I'm to turn the tables on you and I'm going to interrupt you. Well, yes, Purim is, is over. Yes, yes, is Yitzchak interrupting the rabbi because, but here's the, here's the beauty part. Because I'd like to draw attention to a beautiful article that the rabbi wrote, actually. It's got his name, his byline, by Chaim Richman, uh, in the Jerusalem Post print edition and also online. And we've posted it on our Facebook page and on our website. Um, the article was actually appeared in the front page of the second section of the Tuesday Jerusalem Post, which is actually the day after Purim. But, you know, that's how the old print media works. Um, entitled Purim and the Holy Temple, A Tale for Our Time. And uh, yes, the rabbi very, very deftly and uh, exquisitely draws parallels, uh, weaves the parallels between Purim of Esther and Mordechai, Haman and Achashverosh, and today, and the parallels that exists for better for worse in the world in the jewish community in the exilic jewish community of today and even the rabbi even you you actually coin a phrase rabbi notice how you, i'm not interrupting you you, you coin and as opposed to quote a phrase you coin a phrase <laughs> which means you created it um and you call it the cry and eat syndrome because the rabbis and the and the very uh uh honorable jews at the banquet of Ahasuerus. They cried when they saw the temple vessels coming out. They cried when they understood that this meant the temple was not going to be built. But they still ate. And it's uh, almost a parallel, like the opposite of the fast and cry syndrome of, of uh, Tish Ab Av, the ninth of Av. We fast, mourning for the holy temple. Uh, but this, they had a 180-day feast in which they could eat and mourn the loss of the holy temple. That's, that's even better. You know, like, why fast for one day when you can eat for 180 days? It was 180 <laughs> days, correct? <laughs> correct. Anyway, uh, I recommend to everybody to, to read this article. It really is uh, just very beautiful. What oh, you can, gosh. What you can say, and what is it, uh, 400 words? I think it was more than that, and I'm restraining myself here, not interrupting you, because uh, <laughs> yeah, <that laughs> I'm be, saying that that nice things. That wouldn't do, that but, wouldn't um, fit at all. But, and again, and of course, you, you close it on a positive note. And that, of course, is the uh, ever-increasing and intensifying interest uh, by Jews from all walks of life and all perspectives and, and, and understandings who uh, are re reawakening to the significance of the Temple Mount, the Holy Temple. And, uh, in our so time. Which is everything that we do here in um, the Temple Institute and all of our efforts, whether it's Temple Talk, whether it is our video lessons, whether it's any of the projects, and they are very extensive, and sometimes you hear about them. The projects of the Temple Institute are all focused on the actuality, the, the actual initiative that is the duty of the Jewish people to begin the building of the Holy Temple now. That's what this is really all about, and that's what we put our whole life's energy into. And... Um, Somebody pointed out to me, and Yitzchak, you and I were speaking about the fact that, believe it or not, we have done over 400 editions of Temple Talk. Yeah. And for our new listeners, 
who are infatuated with our wonderful program. You know, I hope it's not a passing fancy for you new listeners. I hope you'll stay with us. And we have some listeners that have been listening for a very long time. Temple Talk really is not a new show. It's uh, one of the um, more veteran programs on Israel National Radio. It's been on for many years, I think about 10. All I know is is that we're, we've, to- we're, we've topped way over 400 radio broadcasts. And so it could be asked, and someone did very recently say, do you always find something new to talk about? You always have something new to say? I think we both gave a different answer. We might have. But I want to tie that into Parshat Shmini. And that, I think, is, go- is going to be my, my answer for this broadcast. And, and that, of course, is why people keep coming back to Temple Talk, because we do say new things. But you know what? I'm convinced at this t- late d- date in my life, and after what I've seen and what we continue, Yitzchak, together to see as we plow forward and trudge ahead, trying to bring the message of the Holy Temple's relevance to our world, I'm convinced that the greatest single obstacle to serving God in this world on a psychological level uh, and also uh, uh, in, a, in a very practical sense for, for the Jewish people and for everyone that is seeking God with all their heart, the greatest problem is to keep things new, to keep things alive. You know that falling into a rut falling into a state of complacency, falling into a place where you do things just by, by rote and they're not um, full of um, wonder anymore and excitement. We just do things because it's an empty ritual. That is a horrible situation for a person to be in. The prophets themselves bemoaned even uh, the periods in Jewish history when the temple service became something that was just a ritual without the kavanah, the intention of the heart. So this is an age-old problem, the fact that we always need to feel that our relationship with Hashem is new and exciting and varied, and we're always finding out new things, like with the, with the wonderment of a child, with innocence. Everything should be fresh the way we see it. Every, t- every morning should be, should be like a whole new world. That is definitely the challenge, and there are those amongst us who can live like that. And, and most, for most of us, unfortunately, it's just a brief glimpse that occasionally we get of what life could be if we would be infusing every day with newness. That certainly is the goal of Torah, to make us alive and to make us new. So yeah, um, on Temple Talk, it hasn't been hard. I don't think for us to come up with something new to say every week because we're not the same people that we were last week. I'm convinced that this is the theme of this week's Torah portion as we read about the terrible incidents, the earth-shattering, earth-shattering cons- uh, consequential incidents, the tragedy of the sons of Aaron, Nadav and Avihu, who were killed on the day of the greatest possible joy for the Jewish people and, in fact, the world. And, and it was Hashem's joy also, and we speak none other than of, and it was on the eighth day, which happens to be referring to Rosh Chodesh Nisan, which is coming up. It's coming up very, very soon. The first day of Nisan is actually this year going to be observed on April 1st. And that's no joke. Rosh Chodesh Nisan... Um, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, the first day of the month of Nisan, is in many ways like Rosh Hashanah. It is, in fact, that's a reflection of the age-old controversy in the Talmud about when was the world created. Was it indeed created in Tishrei or was it created in Nisan? And both are correct because one is talking about on a spiritual level, one is talking about a physical level. The idea is, though, that our sages laud in the most amazing way the virtues, the attributes, the aspects, the power, the beauty, the, the, the absolute um, amazing um, transcendental uh, reality of this day, the first day of the month of Nisan, they talk about the fact that this is the day that absolutely perfected the world and upon which all of creation was validated because, of course, we refer none other than to the day, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, aside from the fact that it's the day that's spoken about in Exodus 12, this shall be for you the first of the months. That's talking about the first 
mitzvah, the first commandment that Israel received as a nation while yet in Egypt was the mitzvah, the commandment of sanctifying the new moon, and it was talking about the new moon of Nisan. But the main thing that we're talking about in this week's parsha is that it was on Rosh Chodesh Nisan, that was the eighth day, the final day of the, of the week-long consecration of the tabernacle in the desert and the day that Moshe put it together and that it stood and that was the day that fire came down from the Shamayim, the heavens, onto the altar, the first day of the priestly service, the first day of the priestly garments. It's the day that the Zohar says was like a perfume for the world. It was like an exquisite type of finishing off of creation because basically it was the world saying to Hashem, oh, yes, thank you. We was, want you in the world. It was for real. Yes, here, here, please stay with for us here. Thing. Here's a home that we built for your presence. And that, that's what beautifies everything. That's why the four-letter permutation of the tetragrammaton that's Kabbalistically associated with each month, the one that's associated with Nisan, is frontwards. It's the only month in which the four letters of Yud and He and Vav and He appear and they emanate, according to the Holy Arizal, from the verse that states in Psalms, Yismechu, that's the Yud, Hashamayim, that's the He, Vitagel, that's the Vav, Haaretz, that's the He, let the heavens rejoice and the earth be glad, and that spells out an acronym, the first letters of those four words, Yismechu Hashamayim, Vitagel, Aretz, is Yud, and He, and Vav, and He, Hashem's name, frontwards, because that is the day that the heavens and the earth are glad, because we're letting God into the world. And of course, that is why we celebrate for the past five years, we celebrate this wonderful occasion of the dedication of the tabernacle with a burst of temple consciousness and activism and education and everything about the temple and the Temple Mount, which is called the International Temple Mount Awareness Day, which we are observing this year on March 30th, which is actually the second to the last day of the month of the second Adar in honor of the upcoming Rosh Chodesh Nisan, You'll hear more about that later. It's coming up very, very soon. It's in another, how many days, Yitzchak? Uh, 12 days? It's in another 12 days or so. I think less than that, even. And it is going to be very, very beautiful. We've already had our first sponsors. As yes, a we have. As a fact, and you can see them online. Uh, and, of course, everyone who does sponsor will post uh, your name on on our website, on our Facebook page. It's going to be very the, exciting. the actual broadcast itself. And... Uh, if you haven't yet sponsored, uh, it's a good idea to start early because you know what? If you sponsor, someone else is going to say, whoa, I want to do that too. And this is how we build a temple. Yeah, so by, maybe by, this is maybe you want to tell people getting the number started, they can call. People. people who are in uh, North America uh, who are interested in dialing a 1-800 number, uh, operators are standing by. And I won't say that if you call by, na by midnight, you'll receive a free ice crusher, but they are standing by now for your pledge to sponsor the Temple Institute's fifth annual International Temple Mount Awareness Day, which of course is a way of sponsoring all of the sacred work of the Temple Institute. And that toll-free number, if you want to call it, and you can call right now, it's 1-800-941-3484. 1-800-941-3484. You can call that toll-free number and just say you want to call to sponsor the Sears International Temple Mount Awareness Day. And if you are telephone shy, you can go to our website and you'll see on every page a link to a page where you can also make a sponsorship via a uh, credit card or check or money order or... PayPal. Or, or, or uh, uh, wheelbarrows full of cash. You didn't say PayPal. Or PayPal. Anyway, it's going to be a wonderful day, Temple Mount Awareness Day, um, but the point is this. I started talking about newness. I started talking about Rosh Chodesh Nisan, and I started talking about Parshat Shemini. So this week's Torah portion includes an anecdote. I shouldn't say anecdote. It includes a, an incident. I shouldn't say incident. It includes something which is one of the only instances of a digression from the laws of the offerings in the book of Leviticus. It's a story, and it's about what happened to Aaron's children. And again, like I started saying, 
we all deal with it, with the fact that we want our lives to be exciting, we want our relationships to be exciting, we want our perception of godliness and the way that we approach Hashem, we want it to be new, we want it to be full of vim and vigor, we don't want to get old. Getting old is the worst thing, and by this I refer to getting mentally old, by getting stale. We, growing old is very, very beautiful. Take it from me. <laughs> but the fact is, I mean, we don't ever want our, our thinking to be uh, limited or to be in any way prejudiced. We want everything to be a, a new experience. So what happens? What happens is that in this week's Torah portion, on this eighth day, on Rosh Chodesh Nisan, with all of, of that which I mentioned, the, the, all of the, 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 the beauty, the, the majesty, the grandeur, the excitement of what that day means... That is the most exciting, you know, absolutely breathtaking, supernal day imaginable. I mean, I mean, this is what the creation has been waiting for. And Israel knew that. And Israel felt that very strongly. And the day of, of the establishment of the tabernacle permanently that day, I mean, who could imagine what that, what that means to see that we have succeeded in, in bringing the Sinai experience of Hashem's presence into everyday life? by building the tabernacle and fulfilling all of Hashem's mitzvot like that in the desert. It was so hard. And now when the fire came down from heaven and, and, and it was a sign that Hashem really wanted to rest His presence amongst the people, I mean, can, does it get better than this? Does it get better than this? And so there's two people, Nadav and Avi, who should never be portrayed as being in any way negative or bad or or backsliding or anything. No matter what you read, understand that the Midrash is is conveying different ideas about about the human condition and the challenges that we have. And so, so yes, there are many different lessons that are interpolated onto their actions, but don't forget that they were tzaddikim, even if they had their failings. They were, they were, they were very, very high souls. And so they're there, and they're seeing all of this, and they're seeing this incredible substantiation of everything that they always wanted to allow themselves to believe, but were afraid to. Yes, it's real. It's real. This is what we are living for now, and they're just totally taken over with this incredible enthusiasm for life. What joy of living every moment for Hashem. And so they do something. And basically what it is that they did is that they did something that was not Hashem's will. And Hashem tells us very, very clearly how to channel our own potential, how to channel the, the, the potential for, for, for growth and to sanctify him, and the, and the greatest sanctification of his name in this world is by doing exactly what he says, which is not such an easy thing to do. And their kavanah, their intention is so pure. Who would be there, right, from, from you and I, who would see something like this and not, with all, every fiber of our being, just be obsessed with one thing, and one thing only? And what is that? I don't want this moment to end, ever. I don't want this moment to end. I, if only I could always know that on, that on call, I could always feel the way I'm feeling now, that I could always have this kind of experience and know how close I am to Hashem. And so they went and they tried to find a way of, of initiating that on their own so that it could always be there with them. And isn't that exactly what we're talking about? They wanted it to be new. They wanted it to be fresh. They didn't want it to get stale. They wanted to, to, to capture the excitement and the joy and the wonder and the, and the powerful holiness and the spiritual high of the eighth day and the day of the dedication of the tabernacle. They wanted to own it. They wanted to make it theirs. But instead, unfortunately, it resulted in a tremendous tragedy because that's not exactly the way to do it. And so the, 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 the irony here of, of, of this dynamic, the challenge that we're talking about is that on the one hand, the secret of life, the secret of serving Hashem and making every day count is for everything to always be new. But you know what? It can't be on our terms. It has to be completely plugged into the reality of, of our limitations. And, and, and believe me, through every piece of advice that the Torah gives us and, and the greatest of our teachers, the greatest masters, they do define the mitzvot as advice. They're like threads of light that Hashem gives us for injecting into our everyday banal existence and consciousness. It's a way of injecting into that Hashem's presence. And they try to do that in a way that wasn't 
the authorized part of the manual. If, if something works, as we've said this before, if you have a manual about how, uh, how a machine works, why do it a different way? Why do it a different way? So they wanted it to be on their terms. And you know what I think I'm finally understanding? You know, Yitzhak, you and I have always spoken about the fact that when we study the Midrash, we have to understand the language is a parable, a metaphor. It's very poetic. It's very, very um, symbolic. It's, it's not literal. So this famous Midrash about what happened to them, how they died. And the Midrash says that a fire came out from the Holy of Holies as like a line and it split into four different threads and it split two and two and two of these lines of fire went into the nostrils of Nadav and two went into the nostrils of Avihu so there's one fire came out from the Holy of Holies split into four lines two went into his two went into his and consumed their souls I always kind of wondered what that means do you blame me? I was kind of wondering what that's really talking about. And suddenly it dawned on me, I was thinking about this on Shabbat, that maybe one thing that this Midrash is saying is that, I mean, why use this powerful imagery of, of a fire coming out from the Kodesh Kodeshim and going into their nostrils? So that reminded me, what is it about the nostrils is that in Genesis, when it talks about Hashem creating a man, it says that Hashem breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. So the breath in our nostrils is actually Hashem's presence itself. Hashem, our soul is Hashem. And it's like the fire that went out from the Holy of Holies, like Hashem coming from that place, the concentration of the Shekhinah, kind of like taking back the neshama, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, this so sounds very harsh, but actually what they did was very harsh, wasn't it? Saying like, you know what? Midrash is saying, you know what? I gave you this deposit, this loan, which is life, which is the soul I breathed into you. I gave it to you from the Holy of Holies. I gave it to you, it's part of me, but you know what? I, I said it has to be according to the way it can be done in this world. And you didn't do it that way, and so I'm taking it back. And uh, there's, a, there's a very profound lesson here because the greatest challenge that we all have is to, is to not make any mistakes but to yet have every day infused with tremendous, tremendous spiritual newness and excitement. And I think that the rest of the Parsha, and we've spoken about this before as well, I think the remainder of the Parsha actually tells us the answer of how to keep things fresh and new and not make that same kind of mistake. And uh, I think that that's being alluded to by the laws of Kashrut. So maybe we'll speak about that later. I know, Yitzhak, you have a lot to talk about as well. And um, I'll try not to interrupt you. Thanks for being with us. We'll be right back. Second half, Temple Talk, Israel National Radio. Welcome back to Temple Talk, Israel, National Radio, UniversalTorah.com, Temple Institute's YouTube channel. Uh, it's the 18th day of March, 2014, but much more significantly, significantly, it is the 16th day of Adar Sheni, second Adar, 5774, the day after Shushan Purim, and uh, Rabbi, You've been talking about keeping things new, fresh, in the moment. And of course, the number eight in Torah always means something new, sort of, certainly out of the ordinary, something, uh, um, uh, I wouldn't say supernatural, but uh, it has like metaphysical uh, energy to it, whether it's here the eighth day that we're talking about, or uh, Shmini Atzeret, which is the eighth day, or uh, Shavuot, which is really the, the beginning of, of the eighth week after, of the, of three, after we count seven full weeks. And since it's only seven days the, of creation, the eighth, the eighth always indicates that it's breaking the pattern of mundanity. Right. And uh, we've been talking so much about keeping things new and trying to avoid falling into the trap of doing things by rote. Uh, and, and that's losing, all they really wanted to do. Losing that youthful enthusiasm for life, for reality. And 
just this week, uh, a very, very dear friend of ours, Cammie Davis, uh, wrote a beautiful blog, which I think uh, the blog is on the Times of Israel. Uh, Cammie Davis, I guess you look it up. What was well, her what's name? the title of it? Tell the us the title. The title of the blog is Calling All Orthodox Jewish Nonbelievers. Wow, what a title. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a loaded uh, title. Anyway. So there are Jewish very, Orthodox very nonbelievers? Very beautifully written and very insightful, full of uh, Torah insights. Uh, Cammie herself is not Jewish, but she lives a Torah life and uh, she uh, is full of Torah knowledge and she actually relates an incident that happened um, uh, which brought to her attention the fact that a person can do all the, the mitzvot, can do all the commandments and do it beautifully, perfectly, but lack the enthusiasm and the energy and the uh, ability to to see the newness and the, and the beauty in all of it. So I highly recommend that you look for Kami's uh, blog on the Times of Israel, calling all Orthodox Jewish non-believers. Speaking about Nadav and Avihu, uh, when a few weeks ago, Rabbi, uh, when Yitzchak Meir Malik was in our studio uh, recording some music, which we'll be featuring on uh, this year's uh, International Temple Mount Awareness Day uh, special, he mentioned something, something. I'm not sure even, I don't remember if it was on camera or off camera. If it's on camera, well, this is a teaser then. Uh, it's not a spoiler. It's a teaser. If it's off camera, then we're giving you a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, trivia and that uh, stuff that becomes history in retrospect. He said something very interesting. And I think he heard this, I think he said he heard this from a rabbi that uh, referring to Cain and Abel, two brothers. He said, you know, why do they each have to bring a separate korban, a separate offering, and then have an argument about it? Why couldn't they have just offered it together? And then everything would have been beautiful, right? It's a beautiful message. But ever since then, I've been thinking to myself, whoa, that's exactly what Nadav and Avihu did. They did something together. And perhaps... Even they did it with the consciousness of, of maybe they're trying to rectify what uh, Cain and Abel had done. So this is a thought that's been haunting me now for the past few weeks, and I really, I don't, you know, I don't know where to take it. It hasn't, I don't know where it's leading, but I find it very interesting that we have this beautiful moment in the history of the world. And we have this beautiful concept, two brothers who together, you know, hand in hand, make an offering to Hashem. And the consequences are devastating. And maybe on a very high level, there was a, you know, a certain, a certain, uh, you know, parallel between Cain and Abel, Nadav and Avi, and maybe on a certain level, they actually did rectify the the the, the sin, we should say, of, of the machloket, of the argument of what to bring in that one thought that God rejected his, et cetera, et cetera, that whole unfortunate circumstance. Anyway, I don't know exactly what to do with that, Rabbi. But, but I'm just asking, I mean, I'm listening and very intrigued to your thought, but I mean, I don't really understand where you're going with it because the fact is that... Um, the this is not what he asked for, and so what kind of rectification was it? Yeah, they did it together as brothers, but it wasn't on the mark at all. It wasn't on the mark, no. And I'm wondering, but uh, I, I've, I just always found it very intriguing, the connection between the parts of the Parsha and why the laws of, of Kashrut are so detailed here. At the conclusion. The rest of the Parsha. The rest of the parsha is all about is all about keeping kosher. Right. I, well, I would assume that Nadav and Avihu kept kosher. They were they were good Jewish boys. I would assume that they kept kosher. But but the interesting uh, parallel here, or or contrast, is that keeping kosher is you know a daily routine. 
it's uh, we've been talking about you know to keeping things new and, and exciting and and seeing the the beauty in the moment and keeping kosher is is almost a mundane thing you know if you let it be I mean certainly it's just like yeah you buy the right foods and you make sure it's processed the right way and you OU oh, don't on eat everything. this with that and just make sure that you don't ask the OU about their position about <laughs> Israel but <laughs> right and you make sure you prepare Oops, it properly sorry. and you know eat it at the right time. And that just seems to be the very opposite of the, you know, unbridled enthusiasm and, and losing themselves in the moment that, uh, of the experience of Nadav and Avihu. Or to, or to hone that, e- that statement even further, mm-hmm. I, I think sitting down to a meal mm-hmm. is the polar opposite yeah, of, of what they did. They, they, they did. tried to bring an offering to Hashem, and they were... It was like an astral projection. It was like so. High. In fact, it did become an astral projection. It was so high. They wanted this s- out, practically out of body mm-hmm. uh, experience of of this tremendous spiritual magnitude. The opposite of that is like being so human that you know I'm hungry now. I've got to stop and I've got to refuel. I've got to sit down and have a meal. And the Torah is saying, well, when you do that, right. these are the rules. And so, so it seems to be that the that the the, the parsha is telling us that you know. All that enthusiasm and that desire to draw close to Hashem, you can't, you can't have peak moments, you know, for every moment of your life. But you can translate that into, into something that's full of meaning and depth and and, and enlightenment in the way you behave. I, I want to go further, okay. and I I want to say, these are the good old days as Carly Simon said. No, mm. this is the peak moment. The peak moment is living a, a life of Torah. What did they want, after all? They wanted to be so close to Hashem. They wanted to emulate Him. They wanted to, they wanted to uh, master that moment and have it ready at beck and call. They wanted it their way. They wanted it now. The idea of keeping the mitzvot of Hashem is that that is how we do that, but yet... We are who we are. We are human beings. But when we translate the 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 um, the transcendent, you know, experience of, of of connection to Hashem into what it means to live a Jewish life in this world and keep Hashem's mitzvot and honor Him by doing what He tells us to do, h- how does it get higher than that? That is the real thing. In other words, their their mistake was that they were looking for something that was. If you'll pardon me, I, again, they were tzaddikim. But you know what? What they did was basically fabricated. It was a an artificial high, and I think I think that this is exactly what the Torah's message is here. That that in in trying to deal with this issue of fighting complacency and wanting everything to be new, we are very often tempted, um, seduced, fooled into thinking that we can use something that's extraneous, that's an external stimuli, that is something that is not natural to, um, to, to bring about this altered state of consciousness. But the fact is, the highest that we could get, and it can be very high, it's like it can be, a, 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 we can keep them that moment all the time when we have our full heart and soul in the mitzvot. And it's like, what what a life! What a life of my! Of, I'm actually taking Hashem's word and transforming it into this meal, into this action, into this thought. I mean, that is how we live for Hashem. I've just always been convinced, on some level, that that's the message of the juxtaposition of these issues in in this week's parsha. That just live the life that I tell you to live, Hashem says. Don't look for a shortcut. This is how you can always remain very, very close to me. And of course, part of the beauty of, of, of keeping kosher and why I think it addresses the, the Nadav Avihu conundrum, syndrome, is that it's a chok, meaning there's no logical reason for it. There's no... There's no rational basis for keeping kosher. Yes, people say it's healthy. They say this, they say that, whatever. But we do it because God said so. And in that, in that equation, we do it because God said so, not because it resonates on a rational level. That's where the magic is. That's where the moment is. That's where the high is. And that in itself is such a, a, a message of honesty, humility, 
recognized humanity that I don't know. I don't know everything. I, I was just learning recently with with a uh, chavruta of mine. Uh, I was learning uh, very beautiful sources in the in the Yerushalayim uh, Talmud and other other uh, sources, and we were learning that one of the real descriptions of a term that is unfortunately, in my opinion, abused and misused in our generation, and that is a gadol. Who is considered to be a gadol? Who is considered to be a great, accomplished leader in Torah? That is something that is given out quite freely today to the leader of this or that <laughs> group or party or whatever. And I'm not saying that they aren't that they're not great rabbis. I'm just saying. Everybody, you know, the constituency of each candidate is, says that their rabbi is the greatest rabbi of the generation. Well, interestingly, an ancient source of our sages tell us that one of the criteria for a person to be considered a gadol, an accomplished great man in Torah, is for him to be, to be able to say, I don't know the answer. I don't know. And you know what? I got to tell you, I haven't seen very often... Uh, a, a, a rabbi in our generation who says about something, I don't know the answer to that. And I think that that is one of the greatest lessons of this coming Shabbat. This coming Shabbat is Parshat Para. Parshat Para is where we read the special maftir, the additional Torah reading. We take out a second Torah scroll if we have more than one Torah scroll in the synagogue. Otherwise, we just roll it to the proper place. And we read for the last a uh, man who is called up to the Torah this Shabbat, we read Numbers 19, for the beginning of Numbers 19, which of course is the ordinance of the red heifer, which is a subject that we all find very riveting and compelling, and you can learn all about it at a special link on the templeinstitute.org website. The concept of the renewal of red heifers is one that I personally have been involved with for most of my life, and we do have a number of kosher red heifers, that are all ready for use in the Holy Temple. And of course, in order to reestablish the purity necessary to be, to be able to use the implements that we've created and to rebuild the Temple, the only thing missing is the ashes of the red heifer, and that is considered the ultimate chok. As you mentioned, Yitzchak Kashrut, the laws of the kosher diet, is a chok, meaning it's not a law about which there is a rational explanation. Yes, Today, we know that this type of diet prevents certain types of cancer and all sorts of things, but Hashem says, that's not why I told you to do it. I told you to do it simply because I told you to do it, and it is beyond the realm of human comprehension, and that which is considered to be the ultimate example of that type of law that's beyond the realm of human comprehension is the ordinance of the red heifer of Numbers 19, which is beyond human comprehension, how this particular facility device renders those that were impure pure, those that were pure impure, and that is the only exclusive antidote for restoring purity in the world. And it is so mysterious. King Solomon, who knew everything, he, he said a whole verse about it in Ecclesiastes. I thought I'd become wise, but it's far from me, because he saw that it's impossible to grasp the secret of the red heifer, which Moshe did know. But one of the most beautiful and compelling lessons about the red heifer, uh, especially for this generation, which is a generation that is so plugged in to instant knowledge. You've got this machine in your phone. Yes, you. <laughs> you. Everyone's feeling their pockets right now because everybody, there's nobody that's listening to this program that doesn't have. In fact, I only know one person in the whole world that doesn't have a cell phone. Everybody's got this machine. They use it all day long. What is that old old joke now that's on Facebook? I have a I have something in my pocket uh, uh, that with one button I can I have access to all the knowledge of the world, and I use it to look at pictures of funny cats and to f have fights with total strangers. But in any event, so we're so plugged into knowledge and and the incredible ability to um, have access to the sum total of of experience. But you know what? There's something that we don't know. Who's a gadol? Are you a gadol? Are you a great person? Meaning, can you, can you stomach it? Can you stomach the feeling of admitting that there is something that you can't know now in this world? And I, you know, I think that one of the most beautiful and sublime and complex aspects of the red heifer being the secret of bringing about Israel's purity is that maybe one of the messages of the Torah is that the secret of purity is humility and being able to say, I don't know, because we don't understand why Hashem gave us the red heifer. And as Rashi says, that's why the nations of the world make fun of us. Why do you do something you don't understand? Oh gosh, that's a good question. But in any event, 
this goes along with everything that we're talking about because there's nothing as new and unique in human experience in serving Hashem as being able to do something and say, you know what, I don't even know. I just believe that this is what Hashem wants me to do. I don't have to explain everything. I can explain most things. I can explain why I have to honor my parents. I can explain why I'm not allowed to kill someone. I can even explain why I have to keep Shabbat. But I can't explain how the red heifer works. But you know what? This is a sign of my integrity and connection to Hashem, who I believe is forever. And how appropriate that the, the red heifer is a prerequisite uh, for granting the purity necessary to enter into the inner courtyards of the Holy Temple. And of course, we read it now as preparation for Right. For this Passover. is the reason for the custom of, re of reading it, the, this, if why it's one of the four special Shabbatot, is because in order for all the pilgrims, the millions of Jews that are be going to be coming, God willing, this year to the Temple Mount to bring the Passover offering, the first they have to become purified. So that's why we read it now. It's a preparation for the upcoming holiday of Passover. And I think it's really beautiful how this year it doesn't come out every year, but this year it's coming out as the maftir of Parshat Shemini. Because mm -hmm. again, I think I think there is a connection between Nadav and Avihu's position of wanting it now and wanting it our way. And again, I'm not saying it in a bad way. There's plenty of commentators who who cast Nadav and Avihu in a negative light, but that's not the thing to do. I'm telling you, it's not because they were great men. They just didn't understand, or or they are coming to teach us rather. They're coming to teach us that the way to infuse newness into our lives and to keep that feeling of, <gasps> oh, of what they saw that day on the eighth day is to live a Torah life. And ultimately, and, and what's the example that the rest of Parashat Shemini elongates and gives us at great length is Kashrut, and that's also Chok, like Paraduma. And there's nothing like keeping Hashem's mitzvot because we don't know exactly the explanation for everything. Speaking of things that we don't know the explanation mm -hmm. for, there's a plane missing with uh, 239 people, isn't it? For a long time, Is nobody knows like? what happened, but some details are beginning to come out. And uh, whereas in the very beginning of the saga, uh, the terrible, terrible human tragedy that all these families are going through such a horrible period of anxiety, in the very beginning, nobody was saying that there could be anything amiss. Everyone was saying it has to have been an accident. And now, um, the word is that it definitely was not an accident. And this is, I think, um, very much connected to the Holy Temple. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Because the Holy Temple is all about the revelation of Hashem's presence and the plan for all mankind and peace and unity. And I think that the forces that were behind this incident are all about, uh, again, a continuation of, of the underlying theme of Megillat Esther, are all about hiding Hashem's presence in this world. And you know very well what forces I'm talking about, and that's becoming clearer every, every day. But of course, it's extremely politically incorrect to say what we think. But we think that those forces are behind this incident as well. And it's the same forces that we deal with on a daily basis in terms of our struggle for the freedom of the Temple Mount and for the freedom of the consciousness of the Jewish people to, to rebuild the Temple, to realize that it's up to them. We're fighting a war here, and it's a war about the concealment of God in the world. And the war is being fought, ironically, in the name of God and in the name of religion, in the name of, of, uh, of uh, everything that's supposed to be good. And it's all a charade. And unfortunately, there are people that are getting caught up in it. And, and these messages of Torah, the messages of Parshat Shmini, of keeping our service alive and fresh and of living a life for Hashem and of being able to admit that we don't know everything and of being able to be uh, uh, reserved in our humanity and with the dignity of reflecting the divine image. This is exactly what the, the, these other forces are uh, trying to uproot. And those, that humility is our is our strength it's our it's our weapon of choice if you, if you want to put it that way in, in the struggle because as you said to be a, a gadol to be a great uh, scholar a great person it begins with humility it begins with admitting that you don't have all the answers and how could you because this is god's world and uh, he's always going to be one one step ahead of you 
And, uh, and you know that we're right about Hashem's name, uh, presence being hidden. And you know that we're right about uh, people not knowing everything because, uh, and again, I'm just catching up. It's lots happened since our last broadcast. But you know that last week, a um, uh, record number of missiles fell in Israel. And you probably didn't even know that because it wasn't reported anywhere. And uh, that's just another example of uh, the same forces that are aligned against us. A whole lot of things happening. You know, just over the weekend, Rabbi, over the Purim weekend, we got a, more than a thousand new likes on our Facebook page, which is unprecedented for us. But I just like to say, if you haven't yet liked us on Facebook, now's the time. Get in, get into it, and be part of this ever-growing community. The Temple Institute's Facebook page really is not just a Facebook page; it's an online e-magazine with incredible updated features every single day. So get plugged in to the world of the Holy Temple and uh, be full of humility. You don't have to know everything, but it's good to stay in touch with what's happening at the Temple Institute, the Holy Temple. Thanks for being with us, Temple Talk.